So without further ado, I want to um, introduce Susan Osmo. She's with us today to talk about why retinopathy of prematurity is still a growing problem. Susan is a research administrator and an ROP program manager at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. And she manages several multi-center ROP related research projects. And she's been doing this for, gosh, the past 12 years, probably feels like more to Susan. <laughs> She's also the coordinator for the IO, um, IROP consortium. She does research groups and she is part of the team that has built an artificial intelligence tool that's recently um, been designated as a breakthrough device by the FDA for diagnosing plus disease. Susan is, Susan is the acting ROP coordinator for Dornbecker Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at Oregon Health and Science University and works on the ROP task force in that unit. So she helps provide clinical research data and helps provide new protocols for oxygen management and infants at risk for ROP. Um, she's really just immersed herself in that program to help um, not only the infants, but the care unit as well. Susan was the only non-physician member of the writing committee for the latest international classification of ROP, the third edition that was recently published. And I think we're gonna hear a little bit more about that today. So Susan, I will turn it over to you. Um, and thank you guys so much for being a part of this with us today. Hello, uh, I'm Susan Ostmo. Thank you, Candace. Um, as Candace mentioned, I'm a research administrator and our pre program manager at um, OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Um, I have been involved uh, with ROP research and imaging for about 12 years, as she mentioned, and I've seen uh, many changes in how the disease is diagnosed and managed during that time span. Um, with all of the knowledge that the ophthalmology community has gained in the decades since discovering the disease, uh, ROP remains the number one cause of childhood blindness worldwide. So understanding the disease itself is just the beginning in to figuring out how to help reduce the number of children that go blind every year. So with that introduction too, I think it's really important to gauge a starting point for all of us who have joined today. So how would you rate your current knowledge of ROP before we start into this session? Um, let's just go ahead and rate that knowledge and then you can hit submit. And we'll watch a few of those come through for just a second and then we'll jump back in. All right, so we'll close this poll. You can hit done on your screen if you see that poll, and I'm gonna go ahead and close that out, and then Susan will turn you loose. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll just begin uh, with a brief overview of the disease and how it can lead to blindness um, in premature infants. I know a lot of you know, know some about ROP or a lot about ROP, but I'll just start with, um, the beginning in 1942, ROP was defined as a progressive disorder that was seen exclusively in premature infants of low birth weight who were provided additional oxygen at birth. Oxygen was given liberally to many babies through oxygen cots, similar to the one seen here in this slide. And although there was an increase in the survivability of premature infants because of the introduction of these oxygen cots, the incidence of blindness in these children was increasing. So when we talk to families um, at our NICU or at other NICUs, we um, like to relate and tell them that Stevie Wonder went blind from ROP back in 1950, when doctors knew much less about the pathology or cause of the disease, let alone about any methods for treatment. The retina is one of the last things to develop in utero and doesn't usually fully mature until about 40 weeks gestational age. When there is premature exposure to oxygen, this creates abnormal um, growth of the blood vessels within the underdeveloped retina. Um, so while vascularization of the retina happens over weeks to months after the baby's born, regular ophthalmoscopic monitoring is required to make sure that severe disease doesn't occur. 
So how does this abnormal blood vessel growth occur? Uh, this cartoon shows normal vessel growth within the retina while in utero, uh, but before term. Uh, notice the depiction of smooth vessels with normal branching that are just immature and have not yet fully vascularized the entire retina. Researchers began using mouse and rat models to help um, understand the pathology of the disease, as well as how premature exposure to oxygen affects the development of these vessels and can lead to loss of vision. So this is what we've learned from those studies. Supplemental oxygen and ox oxygen fluctuations can delay vascular development. So here we go from a normally developing retina with immature vessels in utero to a baby being born early and the retina exposed to oxygen prematurely. As depicted in this right cartoon um, and was found in the rat and mouse models of ROP progression, oxygen seems to create retinal vessel loss and stunts vessel growth. Um, in other words, oxygen has an inverse relationship with blood vessel growth. So this is often referred to um, as phase one of the disease. And as the baby matures, the resulting non-vascularized retina becomes increasingly metabolically active or hypoxic. So there's lower oxygen levels as the baby's getting bigger, stronger. Um, in the mouse model of ROP, it was found that there was a relationship between vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF, these VEGF proteins, um, and that abnormal blood vessel growth is often um, referred to as the phase two of the disease. So where there used to be elevated oxygen levels, there's now a reduction in oxygen levels, which stimulates the increase of the VEGF in the avascular area of the retina. And then that produces the abnormal blood vessel growth at the point where those vessels were shunted. So then, this creates further neovascularization at that, ne at that demarcation line. So that, that cluster of new bl blood vessel growth starts growing into the vitreous as seen here in the right cartoon. Um, so if elevated levels of VEGF persist, then ROP worsens and could develop into severe disease and cause retinal detachment if it's permitted to progress. Very quickly, I'll just review how ROP is classified. When diagnosing ROP, physicians refer to a zone, a stage, and a condition of the vessels or presence of plus disease. We'll start with zone. The zone defines the location of how far peripherally the vessels have grown. There are now four zones recognized within the latest classification. Zone one is the area of the retina closest to the optic disc in the center. And the newly defined posterior zone two is recognized as that area that's about two disc diameters outside of zone one. But it's important to note because it should still be concerning to an examiner with vessels so um, posterior to the optic disc. Then there, um, as the vessels grow out, uh, there's zone two and then the most peripheral zone three, which is the outermost crescent and closest to full vascularization. Uh, there are five stages of ROP with stage one being the most mild and stage five being the most severe and involves total retinal detachment and blindness. This image shows stage two with an elevated ridge where the white arrow is pointing and a small tuft of stage three where the red arrow is pointing. So if there is more than one ROP stage present, then the eye is classified by the most severe stage that is seen. Now let's discuss 
plus disease, which is the primary indicator of treatment requiring disease. So plus disease is defined by appearance of dilation and tortuosity of the retinal vessels. And pre-plus is slightly less, but still has abnormal vascular dilation and tortuosity. The posterior vessels within zone one are the vessels that are examined when you are considering the presence of plus and pre-plus. The condition of the vessels is used as this marker for ROP that requires treatment, but often even world experts disagree about what constitutes plus disease. And we'll continue to talk about that as we go along. So now let's get to the topic of the day. Why is ROP a growing problem when we understand so much more about the pathology of the disease and in this day and age of advanced technology. Um, as mentioned earlier, medical advances have drastically increased infant survivability when they're born prematurely. Babies born up to 17 weeks early can survive because of supplemental oxygen. Um, and so more babies are needing exams. ROP is a growing international problem especially in areas of the world that do not have specialized NICUs or have limited access to resources. With more babies at risk of severe ROP and that are in need of routine screening, there are also not enough specialists to diagnose the disease adequately. There is high medical legal liability compared with the amount that is compensated to physicians for exams. And on top of all of this, the disease itself is difficult to diagnose. As mentioned earlier, even so-called world experts can disagree with one another on what is deemed treatment requiring disease. So let's break down all of these issues. Uh, first of all, the three, there's been three epidemics of blindness due to ROP that have been described. Uh, the first and second epidemics both occurred in high-income countries initially in the 1940s and 50s uh, because of preterm infants being exposed to unmonitored 100% supplemental oxygen in order to help them survive. The last 30 years have been experiencing the third epidemic, which has features of the first and second epidemics and is occurring in countries and regions that have scaled up their neonatal intensive care. But even higher income countries are still seeing a continued increase in infants surviving at earlier and earlier ages, creating larger numbers of babies in need of ROP screening. And in 2010, it was estimated that 32,300 preterm infants worldwide became blind or visually impaired from ROP with the highest number in East, Southeast Asia and Pacific region. You can see from these uh, small pie charts depicting various regions and percentages of survival, but with blindness or severe visual impairment, it's much higher in the lower to middle income countries. That medium purple slice reflects those numbers of children who go blind within that region. Higher income countries still have a small percentage of children going blind, but lower and middle income countries have the largest percentages. Uh, the low to middle income countries, there's a disparity in relevant ROP screening guidelines or policies resulting in the use of this unmonitored oxygen. In these settings where neonatal care is of suboptimal quality, it leads to these infants who are larger and more mature, developing severe and aggressive ROP. The next issue in the growing ROP program is too few physicians to perform screening exams. With more and more babies at risk of ROP, there is a lack of doctors wanting to specialize in ROP management. So as the numbers of infants are increasing, the number of physicians to examine them is decreasing. 
there are a few reasons that the decrease in physicians is happening. Um, one being that from an ophthalmology standpoint, ROP care is complex. It spans multiple care settings and providers, including those in NICUs, nurseries, and outpatient clinic settings. This requires coordination and communication between providers and ancillary staff, and most importantly, uh, effective communication with patients' family members to impress upon them the importance of continued follow-up. So often providers have to travel to faraway NICUs to perform exams. Um, coordinating this extremely important follow-up is also time-consuming. Um, this is worse in low to middle income countries because it's increasingly growing problem um, with so many kids surviving um, at earlier ages. Aside from the time consuming coordination, the ROP exam itself is very difficult to perform. Uh, it takes a very patient and skilled person to perform an ROP exam with babies trying to stop breathing, and we know that babies and nurses and families get stressed during ROP exams, but physicians are under a lot of stress also. Trying to perform a thorough exam on an already fragile infant is far from easy. And for many trainees um, trying to decide what area to specialize in, there are other areas of ophthalmology that are much less stressful and easier to take on and specialize in other than ROP. There is also a lack of ROP training for residents and fellows in ophthalmology. Um, many ophthalmology trainees report that ROP exams done during their training were performed without an attending directly supervising at the time of the examinations. In other words, a fellow examines a baby alone, but the attending follows with the examination at a different time. And these separate examinations for ROP result in increased stress for already sick infants, as well as logistical challenges with respect to coordination of care in the NICU. Uh, trainees examining un under direct supervision of attendings um, minimize these issues and report that the direct supervision provides additional learning opportunities, with regard to clinical findings, um, treatment recommendations, and even advice given regarding examination techniques. So these supervised trainings are the most ideal, but the supervising physicians report a lack of willingness to have every baby endure two exams. Um, so they prefer very few of these babies to do the double exams. Um, Hands-on training is always the most beneficial um, but there's also a lack of external sources for training to diagnose ROP. Uh, this slide actually shows a student training module um, created by the IROP consortium back in 2013. And it's been tested here in the States and utilized internationally as a tool for additional training. Um, the IROP consortium continues to improve these external sources for training, but nothing compares to hands-on training, which is often difficult to obtain. Another huge hurdle to the decrease in physicians specializing in ROP is the medical legal liability involved. Uh, ROP is one of the most costly medical legal areas within ophthalmology, which has made it more challenging to find qualified physicians willing to take on this area of practice. Um, that and reimbursement for providing ROP screening tends to be less than that which ophthalmologists could generate providing outpatient clinical care or performing ophthalmic surgery. As mentioned earlier, the process tends to be time consuming, often requiring physicians to travel to various hospitals away from their regular work site, and there's additional costs to the practitioner um, incurred for compensating administrative staff um, to coordinate this outpatient care. Uh, poor reimbursement and the risk of multi multi-million dollar malpractice settlements have made providing this service uh, pretty undesirable. 
Uh, additionally, documentation of progressive ROP has historically not been great. Um, this slide shows how ROP has been documented in the past, which is not great for recording, um, making record of an exam and trying to prove medical legal liability. So use of imaging systems have helped enormously in being able to track and record disease for progression or regression, as well as for liability purposes. And hopefully imaging for ROP will become the standard of care everywhere and will help support physicians making record of what they see as they perform these exams week to week. Another huge problem with ROP is that even world experts disagree on what warrants treatment requiring disease. Um, so if experts disagree, how are undertrained ophthalmologists supposed to manage disease well for their patients? This slide shows a study that was performed comparing various images with varying degrees of vascular severity um, that were evaluated by ROP experts for plus disease diagnosis. The main finding from this study um, is that inter-expert agreement of plus disease is imperfect. Um, representative images were shown to 22 expert participants. And I'll just kind of go through and explain these. Um, the first image was classified as um, normal by all 22 experts. The second image was classified as plus by two experts and pre plus by nine experts and normal by 11 experts. So quite a disparity. The upper right image was classified as plus by one expert pre plus by 16 experts and normal by five experts and then so on. So you can see that there's a disparity other than the lower center one, which was 100% plus by all experts. There's definitely a discrepancy um, in how these experts are classifying plus disease. Um, there's several potential explanations for the variability in the diagnosis. Uh, some may pay more attention to tortuosity versus dilation, or some experts are more aggressive in their treatment plans where others are more conservative. Um, but this inconsistency amongst those who are the most experienced makes it difficult to come to a consensus on when is best to treat. In the interest of always trying to improve ROP diagnosis and management and to help with more expert agreement, the International Classific Classification of Retinopathy of Prematurity Committee, also known as ICROP Committee, was formed several decades ago and is a group of world experts that changes, you know, as people retire and come into the, um, the field. But they're world experts on ROP who write a consensus statement, it happens about every 15 years, that creates a standard nomenclature for classification of the, of the disease. And some of that we've already discussed when we were describing zone and stage and plus. The ICROP committee came up with these terms and definitions when they initially published in 1984. And then it was expanded, the classification was expanded again in 1987 and revisited in 2005. The classification was updated most recently in 2021 in an article presenting a third revision, or we like to call it the ICROP-3. The group felt revisions were required for many reasons, some of which involved concerns about subjectivity in critical elements of disease classification, including expert disagreement with PLUS disease, as well as recognition that patterns of ROP in some regions of the world uh, do not fit neatly into that current classification system. In their deliberations to update disease classification, the ICROP-3 committee conducted some image reading exercises in 2019. The 34 world experts in ROP were shown the same 30 images 
and we're asked to classify each image as normal vessels, pre-plus vessels, or plus vessels. They found that they were reasonably consistent when images were extremely severe and very mild, but the inconsist inconsistencies came in the areas bordering between normal and pre-plus and also between pre-plus and plus. You can see that this slide, in this slide, that the most extreme plus images are red and were consistently ranked by the 34 experts as severe at the top and that the most normal, which were represented as green, were consistently ranked by the experts as mild. There is wide variability in the classification by ROP experts when it comes to these between areas, um, but those are the areas that are very important in terms of determining closer follow-up or even whether it's a borderline treatment situation. These variations, um, as we talked about, could occur because uh, experts have different personal cut points for the amount of vascular abnormality required for PLUS disease. Um, and the committee recommended that terms like pre-PLUS and PLUS should continue to be used, but emphasize that these terms represent a continuous spectrum of retinal vascular changes. The IROP consortium of researchers initially brought about this idea in an article in ophthalmology by Campbell et al. in 2016. Um, as mentioned, the wide variability in classification of PLUS disease by the ROP experts occurs because experts have a different equipoise for the amounts of vascular abnormality. Um, and this is imp has important implications for research, for teaching, and for patient care, and suggest that um, a continuous PLUS disease severity score may reflect more accurately the behavior of expert ROP clinicians, and that it may better standardize classification in the future. Uh, because of these findings and because of their own variability in the classification exercises, one of the major updates in the latest ICROP-3 is a recognition that PLUS is a continuous spectrum from normal to pre-PLUS to PLUS with these sample images demonstrating this range. Um, this figure demonstrates gradings of the spectrum uh, by the members of the committee. And although gradings along the spectrum um, may vary amongst the observers that there was better agreement on either end of the spectrum, but that um, all of the experts were able to place the same images in order of severity, whether they called it normal or pre-plus, there is definite agreement in when the disease is progressing. This has important importance in clinical practice for assessing, you know, whether disease is getting better or worse. So what does all this mean? Um, without consistent diagnosis of PLUS disease, uh, which is the most important marker for physicians in determining the need for treatment, there will continue to be some babies that are not treated in time and others who are treated potentially unnecessarily. Given all of this, uh, where are we going in the future in order to improve ROP diagnosis and timing of treatment? Firstly, the use of artificial intelligence in helping to diagnose ROP has been an area of research for a long time, but now there is a tool that has been fast-tracked with the FDA as a breakthrough device and validation of that system is currently underway. Uh, talk more about that in a minute. <laughs> Secondly, because of the lack of ophthalmologists trained in diagnosing ROP, telemedicine programs are growing worldwide and will hopefully help to fill those gaps in care. Thirdly, risk models are being studied with the hope of eventually being able to reduce 
the number of ROP exams necessary on lower risk babies. Okay, the first of these where are we going topics is the advance of artificial intelligence in ROP. Because PLUS disease is the major determinant in di diagnosing treatment requiring ROP, efforts have been made to quantify the vascular changes in ROP using the features of dilation and tortuosity. Initially, computer systems were trained on retinal images with manually traced vessels, and then these systems could automatically identify and trace blood vessels on their own and quantify the amount of dilation and tortuosity within the retinal image. So in 2018, Brown et al. reported the results of a fully automated deep learning based system for automated diagnosis of PLUS disease. The system essentially was trained on more than 5,000 images. All those images were assessed by a consensus diagnosis of three independent image graders along with an ophthalmoscopic diagnosis to create one reference standard. The reference standard was provided for all 5,000 plus images and the system was trained on those. The machine learning systems, they learn the features that best correlate with the input image and with the reference standard diagnosis of the experts. So it takes what the vessels look like, it takes the expert diagnosis, and it learns what it's supposed to say in terms of normal, pre plus, or plus, and give it a quantifiable diagnosis. This fully automated algorithm diagnosed plus disease in ROP with comparable or better accuracy than human experts when it was tested. This AI algorithm was further developed to produce that quantifiable measure of ROP severity. The IROP consortium developed an automated ROP vascular severity score through these computer science methods and came up with a score that ranged from one to nine. This um, quantitative score is consistent and reflects disease progression. So, um, each of these skeleton images represent a number of one to nine. So similar to getting your blood pressure um, numbers, the vascular severity score would give a number from one to nine and is a tool that may be helpful for physicians as assistive diagnosis in determining when it's appropriate timing for treatment or retreatment. One common criticism for AI algorithms such as this are that there's um, the acceptance by physicians and patients may be low um, because of the inability to explain how the algorithm arrived at a conclusion. Um, these AI systems are often thought of as black boxes where there's a lot of unexplained learning that happens and that makes old school medical people understandably nervous. Um, but these systems are becoming more and more accurate and despite the inexplicability can help better quantify and diagnose ROP. And as AI enters clinical medicine, there is increasing awareness of the need to adjudicate liability from care decisions informed by the AI systems. And to this end, there is a distinction between autonomous and assistive AI systems. So in autonomous systems, decisions are based solely on the output of the AI system. And in assistive systems, the output is used to aid a clinical diagnosis by a physician. And the FDA is rapidly innovating their methods for evaluating uh, to ensure safe implementation of these technologies in clinical care. Um, so as the technologies become more commonplace, the regulatory requirements will likely continue to evolve, um, as will the medical legal implications.
The second of the where are we going with all of these issues, topics, <laughs> is telemedicine. Uh, the ability to easily image a neonatal retina paved the way for telemedicine to provide a more efficient method to screen at-risk babies. There are now multiple examples of successful telemedicine programs in the United States and around the world. Uh, especially in regions where there are too few trained or willing ophthalmologists to manage ROP screening and treatment, telemedicine can allow a single provider to screen babies over a larger geographic area. And for example, here in the state of Oregon, there are many remote areas where medical care as specialized as ROP screening is not available and there are only a handful of providers um, in the entire state. Uh, babies need to be transferred largely to one or two high acuity facilities to get appropriate ophthalmic care. Uh, with addition of more of these telemedicine programs, more remote facilities will be able to provide more comprehensive care for premature babies and families will be able to stay closer to home and not be inconvenienced with a six hour drive just to have their baby screened for ROP. It is the hope that after validation of the IROP deep learning system with the FDA, that the technology can be available and all fundus cameras could be equipped with the software to produce this vascular severity score for retinal images. And this could help telemedicine programs in their ability to better manage ROP care for infants. The third topic of where we're going is this ROP risk prediction. Um, we know that ROP screenings are an essential service in NICUs. However, the current risk models subject infants to multiple physiologically stressful exams. Um, so last year, the IROP consortium researchers studied two separate data sets of patients who were screened multiple times for ROP and fundus images were taken at all of the exams. The images were analyzed by the previously discussed IR, the IROP deep learning algorithm at cut points at, within a window of 32 to 34 PMA post postmenstrual age imaging window. A model for prediction of treatment requiring ROP was trained and optimized, and the researchers were able to demonstrate that analysis of the images at that single exam, 32 to 34 weeks, detected 100% of all infants who eventually developed treatment requiring ROP. And it also was able to, de to detect more than half of those who did not develop severe disease at all. This table highlights those kids that were eventually treated and in both data sets, all eventually treated kids were predicted to need treatment through analysis of those images taken at 32 to 34 weeks. Um, although the system did identify many kids that didn't end up needing treatment, it did catch about half of those who wouldn't develop disease. So what does this mean? Uh, obviously, further, re further research needs to be done in this area, but the implementation of a model such as this could lead to significantly fewer ROP exams for lower risk infants. Uh, it could be a better use of ROP screening resources and um, provide an earlier recognition of treatment requiring ROP. Um, these are important because, you know, we all would love less eye exams. <laughs> um, with this risk model, there are limitations um, of the, the prediction model that one is that it was trained on a data set of infants in the United States. And while it works well with that particular demographic, and would likely translate well to other countries uh, with similar demographics, the tool would have to be separately trained on data sets from low to middle income countries where ROP often occurs in older 
heavier babies. Um, future work to validate this concept in low to middle income countries where potential added value may be even greater uh, given the increasing prevalence of the disease and scarcity of resources um, with the goal of reducing and eliminating blindness due to ROP. So currently we have data sets from Mongolia and Nepal and India that we are looking at and trying to validate a risk prediction model for those demographics and then will hopefully lead to eliminating a lot of the eye exams that actually need to occur in those regions. So blindness from ROP is avoidable, um, but currently still a global health problem. Um, current research to develop artificial intelligence systems is promising and implementing this technology into existing imaging systems could be a solution to this worldwide issue. There are several potential challenges to ensuring that every at-risk baby is diagnosed accurately and in a timely manner. Besides the wide disparities worldwide in the distribution of ophthalmologists between rural and urban settings, and between countries, the diagnosis of ROP is based on this subjective assessment of a disease that a uh, disease severity, and it will it's well established that there is wide variability for all three components in diagnosing um, the disease. So most examiners don't routinely perform photography at the time of examination, um, which hinders their ability to objectively make comparisons across serial exams or even between other examiners. So the adaptation of fundus photography as a standard of care can help with this objectivity and with the addition of AI software to produce a vascular severity score in assisting with the diagnosis as well as implementing some of these risk models can all help um, provide accurate screening, timeliness of treatment, and hopefully begin to alleviate this growing worldwide problem of ROP. Hi, thank you so much, Susan. That was a wonderful presentation. So the last poll that I want to launch for everyone real quickly is now that we have had all of this information, we went through, you know, why is ROP still a growing problem? Um, let's see if we can gauge our knowledge following the information. So we'll take a moment here for everybody to rate how they feel their knowledge is after the presentation. Give it a few minutes for everyone to respond. And you guys can click done when you're finished with that. And then the last thing we'll do is we'll open um, this session up for any Q&A um, in the chat box. So if you're on a phone or a computer system, you may find your chat. There may be three dots at the bottom, which would be a more tab. Um, if you click on that, it can open up a chat box. If not, We've got chat on the side of the screen for those of us that are joining us on the computer. And I had a couple questions submitted to me. Um, so we can pose those to Susan and let her expertise answer some of our wonderful questions. So Susan, I know one of the questions that we had pop up is, do you see the additions of cameras in the care units being important now as we see the growth of AI con kind of on our heels. So do you kind of feel like now is the time to be placing those systems so that when AI starts to take off, we're ahead of the game? Um, absolutely. Uh, I think what we're finding is, you know, for about a decade, we have utilized imaging systems in our NICU um, and we have the retina specialist or the pediatric ophthalmologist right there with us. Um, so it's not 
that's not for a telemedicine purpose. What we use it for is to track disease progression. So beyond the AI, tracking progression or regression of the disease, we feel like is most beneficially done by taking these images and having a recording of what is happening for each patient. Beyond that, I think that having units get used to, um, there's a learning curve in, in taking these images. And because we have a lack of physicians and examiners um, building these telemedicine programs now, um, before the AI is actually available is actually going to be super helpful because the learning curve in terms of getting quality images is, you know, it's a little bit time consuming. So getting units um, used to fundus imaging now is probably going to be most beneficial for when that technology is ready. That makes sense. I think it's so awesome to hear you say that you, you've got cameras placed within your units that really aren't telemedicine driven. I think sometimes we get it in our minds that, oh, if I place a camera in my system that I have to go full telemedicine. And we have seen so many successful programs kind of grow into large telemedicine, meaning they still have their ophthalmologist, you know, right at their side, almost involved. And then we slowly start to to build a bigger gap to help both sides provide the best care possible. So I think that's a really aha moment to hear but that you have so many options. Well, the one other um, advantage, I think, of keeping a system in the rounding um, protocol is that when you are training um, residents and fellows, there's nothing like having them see on a camera what they're supposed to be seeing using the indirect. So um, we find that at KCI, um, our residents and fellows are much better prepared in going out and being able to diagnose the disease than a lot of other trainees. Sure. Um, another question that we had pop up was, why was posterior zone two added? Like, why did we see a value to kind of break up those um, more interior zones? Um, I think there is an equipoise for a lot of physicians um, to, I, I think it has to do with treatment. There's a couple different types of treatment. And I think that a lot of physicians really struggle with um, lasering a baby that has treatment requiring disease with disease still posterior, still so posterior. So you may be out of zone one, but you're so close to the area of central vision and it's a lot of real estate to have to laser. Um, so I think that the IRA crop committee really wanted to recognize the importance of that still posterior area. Cause I think it gave physicians um, a, a better like, hey, yeah, this is still okay to inject even though you're in zone two, um, but buy yourself some time to let those vessels grow out a little bit. And it, I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, there was this um, standard, you know, 10 years ago, like you, you don't inject when you're into zone two and babies were getting lasered with, you know, a lot of retina still left to develop. So, I mean, I think that that was kind of the, the main reason for that, but also to recognize, you know, zone two is a huge area. So are we, are we peripheral zone two? Are we, are we posterior zone two? I mean, and this is all, it, it's kind of like, you know, plus even zone is a spectrum, right? I mean, there's, there's distances out from the optic disc, but it's all a spectrum of disease. Um, we even talk about stage as a spectrum. You know, Pete Campbell and I talk like it's a 1.2 or it's a 2.3. I mean, we, it, and so it is, uh, it, it's all a spectrum, but I think that we wanted to really recognize that that posterior zone two is much more um, important than to, to recognize. 
Sure. So we've had another question posed um, when we talked about the difficulty to diagnose some cases of RO ROP, especially um, if they're not clear on that plus um, side or a normal case. Mm -hmm. So other than an op ophthalmoscope and a fundus photo, what other tools does a physician have to diagnose ROP? Is it FA? Do we see OCT on the horizon? Um, even maybe OCT angiography. This is everyone's favorite subject just to say, when are we going to see OCT and peds? <laughs> um, such a timely question. Um, I work with a group that is building, Candace has seen this camera. Um, it shows on FOSS uh, images, but it's an OCT and OCTA and it's, you know, infrared light. So it's not as, you know, stressful to babies it has a wide field of view and it's it really captures much more quickly you know a, a wide range so yeah um oct um that's i think where this is going um it is definitely um you know obviously a lot of validation needed in in cameras like this uh but you know, it's, it's important to recognize that imaging, even these, these fundus cameras, um, it's, it, they're easy to find, to just be able to get in and see posterior hole images. Um, and that's the most important piece in trying to diagnose plus disease is getting that posterior pole image. Um, and yeah, OCT is on the horizon. <laughs> Um, so we'll put you on the spot here. How far away do you think we are from the AI software? I know that we've been pushing it. The FDA is, is seeming very accepting. So when do um, we think we'll start to see this? Um, I think probably within the next year. Um, we have a data set that we are. So we, we have the the algorithm. Um, we just have a separate data set that we are validating it on. And I think we're going to see within the next year some application submitted and um, an acceptance of a one to nine scale. Um, and I, it'll probably be an assistive tool, um, not an autonomous, but I think that that will be a huge benefit to um, positions in deciding, you know, treatment um, in the future. Absolutely. I know we have talked about this. Anybody who's spent time with me or, or probably Susan in the past knows we've we've kind of talked about how our OP is living a little bit in the past. We've seen so many advancements for diseases and um, adults like diabetics and, you know, macular generation. So I'm super excited to see ROP kind of jump into the gang and really start introducing these new uh, diagnosing options and, and photographic tools to document what we're seeing. So we are at the top of the hour. I'm so excited to be able to present information like this. I'm so thankful, Susan, that you took the time um, to spend with us today and teach us more about why ROP is still a growing program. For those of you that have joined, um, we will have these sessions recorded and available to you. You'll be getting some emails and some follow-up information as well as an evaluation so that we can continue to provide the best sessions possible. Um, I can't thank you guys enough for spending the morning with us, and we look forward to seeing you on a future eSeminar.